How's the weather in uh, San Diego right now? It's beautiful. I'm, I mean, I, I was just thinking, flying in from uh, from from my plane, that how lucky I am to live in San Diego. <laughs> nice. I don't nice. have the uh, vacation blues. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Hello, everybody, and welcome to the Functional Medicine Podcast here at the American Academy of Functional Health. My name is Tal. I'm the educational director, and with me, we're blessed to have Dr. Chill. Hi, everybody. <laughs> uh, Dr. Chill is uh, uh, currently in uh, S San Diego in a beautiful weather. <laughs> That's and, right. <laughs> and we're here uh, in um, in Portland, Oregon, which uh, it's it's getting there. It's getting it's getting nicer. You're, um, you're about to get the nice weather. <laughs> yes, we're about to get the nice weather, so that that should be that should be a lot of a lot of fun. Um, especially where uh, we get a lot of virtual sun. It's we call it virtual sun, which is you know you can see it, but you don't doesn't really, doesn't actually warm you up, <laughs> warm you up. So uh, so it's it's good it's good to it's good to uh, it's nice that it's getting warmer up here in 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 Oregon. So uh, we got. Something we got a special topic for today. Um, it's gonna be it's a it's a much needed I would say topic um, to 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 discuss, which is the low thyroid function, or as as it's referred to, hypothyroidism. And I'm saying it's uh, it's very much needed because there are estimated over 20 million people just in the United States who have some sort of a thyroid condition. And we it's estimated that there are many more that are not, that are either underdiagnosed or misdiagnosed with thyroid conditions. So I wanted Dr. Chill, uh, 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 both of us to kind of uh, talk a little bit and share with you about uh, what's what's two of the major causes of of low thyroid condition and and what what does it actually mean to have low thyroid condition and what some of the issues that are not addressed in the mainstream approach? Um, so it should be should be very interesting, very hopefully very insightful and practical uh, for you to 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 uh, um, using your practice. And uh, I'll just start by giving you a little bit of introductory for for uh, as a, just as a reminder, just something that most of us already know uh, that the thyroid really produces very important hormones that stimulates each one of our cells, uh, our brain, our digestion, our muscles, and we can see that when we have patients coming in with low thyroid function or low hormones production, um, which they have. Maybe they have uh, symptoms such as um, declining memory or slow thinking. Uh, some patients I heard refer it as like a brain fog. Uh, if it's affecting their digestion, then that can cause constipation. If it's impacting their muscles, that can cause muscle weakness and cramps. And of course, uh, our thyroid hormones are um, impact about or responsible for stimulating about a third of our resting metabolic rate. So in other words, the amount of calories that you burn every day at rest um, is a third of it is dictated or, or facilitated by the thyroid hormones. So it's really important to make sure to that you have proper thyroid function, that you also have proper <laughs> levels of thyroid hormone, because we know um, there are many patients who are struggling um, with weight gain, and they, it's very hard for them to lose weight, or they keep gaining weight every year, and they have an underlying thyroid condition. So that's something that's really important. So um, interestingly, when we, it's statistically one out of eight women will have a thyroid condition. Uh, women are five to eight times more likely than men to have a thyroid problem. And it's uh, it, when it comes to diagnosing thyroid or subclinical thyroid condition, we notice something really interesting. Each patient is going to be completely different presentation. Like some patients will have weight gain as their main complaint. Some patients constipation. Some patients, we had patients that didn't complain of fatigue while others did. Uh, we had patients that 
the only symptoms they had is thinning of their hair, while other patients, the only symptoms that they had is, um, is uh, brittle nails. And then sometimes, because of the slower metabolism, sometimes we're seeing patients that they also have high cholesterol. I've seen that also in practice. Uh, so just for you to know that that's something that could be associated with slower metabolism. So Dr. Chill, can you tell us a little bit about uh, what's the association, the connection between thyroid and other possible chronic conditions? Yeah, absolutely. And I'm glad we're talking about this topic because as functional medicine practitioners, a lot or many of our patients will have some of these varying symptoms as Dr. Cohen mentioned, you know, the weight gain or the inability to lose weight, the digestive issues such as constipation and muscle weakness and cramps, they might have some variation of that, of those symptoms. And outside of those symptoms, it's also important to note that low thyroid function can also contribute to the development of several other chronic conditions. As Dr. Cohen was mentioning, oh, even with it can even impact our cholesterol levels. It can also uh, impact other issues dealing with cortisol and stress management. So there's multiple conditions that can be associated with low thyroid function. Another thing that we want to take a look at with thyroid, another important note is that even with a normal, quote unquote, normal TSH level, right? There's something that's called subclinical low thyroid function. So the patient can present with a normal TSH, but their TSH might be high normal, or they might have low, lower than normal uh, T4 and T3, where it's still within the normal range, but it's just on the low side of that. What that can present is they can have subclinical low thyroid function. And this is associated with insulin resistance and diabetes. This can also increase the risk of miscarriages and then preterm deliveries. So it's really important as functional medicine practitioners to assess and monitor all of the thyroid hormones. So we're not just TSH levels, but looking at T4 and T3 levels as well. Yes, absolutely. And we're going to talk a little bit more about doing more, having a more comprehensive approach to address those patients because we're seeing, um, I would say, all, I would say almost all the patients that we have seen that we, or majority of them at least, that we have seen that are coming in with symptoms of hyperthyroidism were were already on thyroid medication, levothyroxine typically. So it's really interesting that while levothyroxine can kind of help to improve their lab markers, right? So it'll help to improve, it might reduce TSH, it might, the thyroid stimulating hormone, and then it might increase T4 and T3, or T4 at least, that's what they measure. Um, interestingly, there's, Many of those patients are still struggling, and we'll talk exactly why they why why they're struggling. But um, like Dr. Chill mentioned, there's there are multiple chron like the thyroid can slow thyroid, let's call it a sluggish thyroid, right? With low thyroid hormones can really impact many of our body system or many of our bo major body systems, right? So it also involved in uh, lipid metabolism. So there's an interesting study that I can mention. It's called the effect of thyroid dysfunction on lipid profile. And they talk about how uh, administrating therapy of uh, with um, um, medication, thyroid medication can actually improve um, abnormalities in the lipid, lipid profile, like abnormalities in cholesterol, right? They also talk about how patients with hyperthyroidism have significantly lower levels of uh, of cholesterol, right? So, or significant levels of LDL, right? Um, so there's there's it's really interesting. There's uh, there's even one report that stated that 
uh, in patients with hypothyroidism, they have high cholesterol because there is a reduction in, their, in the low density, low density lipoprotein, the LDL receptor, the activity of that receptor is now decreased, right? So there's, it's really interesting. And it's something that we believe that any healthcare practitioner should be aware of. And that's what we're doing this, 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 this that's what we're focusing on this podcast. Um, and so one of the things that we really want to talk about is why do patients, why do so many of those patients that are they're still getting, they have thyroid, they they're, have thyroid condition, like hypothyroidism, they still, they get medication, they go to see their primary care, they come back with a prescription, they're taking the prescriptions, maybe their labs look better or, or not yet, but they're on a medication, they're on a hormone replacement therapy, and they still struggle with, um, with weight gain and fatigue or hair loss or um, constipation, right? It's, 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 we've seen those patients over and over again. Most of them are on medication. So I want to, want to kind of give you the three or four major reasons why this could happen. If you see in a patient, you prescribe them a medication or they are prescribed and they still struggle, it's probably one out of three or four of those reasons. Um, the, the, first, the number one reason, obviously, from a functional medicine approach is that their primary care provider gave them a synthetic replacement of T4, but they didn't look at the root cause of the problem, right? And this is something that we're going to go into a, a little bit more in depth about the two major factors that can lead to thyroid conditions. Um, but you have to look at the root cause. It's not enough just to manage their condition by replacing the uh, what the you know it's kind of like subs trying to manage their condition by substituting by adding more hormones, right? Um, we have to look at different aspects of it. Um, for example, another factor that is very common is patients get T4, that's the levothyroxine, synthetic levothyroxine, and about about 40% of T4 is actually converted in the body to reverse T3. Now, with some patients, they might convert T4 to more, more of T4 to reverse T3. So instead of converting 40%, they'll convert 50 or 60 or 70%, right? That'll be converted into reverse T3. And so reverse T3 essentially prevents the activation of cells uh, by T3 which is the active hormone, right? So we got these receptors of, re of, of, of uh, T3. The hormone T3 is floating there. It's supposed to plug in and activate the cells. Unfortunately, reverse T3 comes in, plugs in the receptor, and now those cells cannot be stimulated. So if you don't check for reverse T3 and you don't address the root cause, then of course the patient can have plenty of T4 and plenty of T3, but that's not going to stimulate anything. So there are reasons. There are several reasons why those there, there's going to be a higher conversion into reverse T3. Um, that could be stress, trauma, low calorie diet, inflammation. Those are among the main. There's a few more, um, but that's really important to know. If your patient have chronic stress, it activates the adrenal, which secretes cortisol, which interfere with the production of and, and production of uh, these hormones. If they have trauma, if they had low, low, they are trying to diet and count calories, that could that could slow down their metabolism. If they have chronic inflammation, and then the third factor is, of course, eighty percent of those patients have an autoimmune condition. So it's not necessarily a problem of just producing the thyroid hormones. They actually have an autoimmune condition. They have a chronic inflammatory condition, which their their immune system is attacking their thyroid. Right now, as what we learn, what we teach in our functional medicine program is really how to identify what it is that is attacking that the thyroid. What's causing it? What's causing that autoimmune condition? And more than that, beyond that. Beyond functional medicine, nutritionally, are there any nutritional deficiencies like iodine, iodine deficiency, vitamin D deficiency, selenium deficiency, zinc, right? 
are there specific nutrients that are that are required for thyroid function and they're missing right so or are there any particular nutrients or environmental factors that interfere with that production right um and so that's that's the third factor and then the fourth factor is the way that Western approach, the, the mainstream approach views labs is a little bit different than functional medicine. Now, not only that we have different labs, biomarkers, but in the general approach, TSH is usually, uh, typically, right? It depends on, I, I've saw different facilities that have different references, different lab testing have different lab facilities have different references range, but typically between 0 0.35 to 4.5 is considered normal for TSH. But there are studies and reports that show us that the optimal range for TSH should be between 0 0.5 and 2.5. Anything below or anything above it is, is considered to be non-optimal. And we want for our patients, we want in order for them to feel good, not just, not just reduce complication in their symptoms, but actually function well and feel feel good, we want them to be between that optimal range. Um, so Dr. Chill, tell us a little bit about what what is what is really in, in, important when you, you want to test for thyroid, like you want to test for autoimmunity for Hashimoto, you want to kind of get the complete picture. What are some of the lab markers that are that are important? That's it right there. It's trying to get the complete picture of the thyroid function, right? We're not just taking a look at TSH levels. So outside of even just TSH levels, right? Uh, as you mentioned, there is a standard range, which is used conventionally, but as functional medicine practitioners, we're going to get many patients that come into us saying, I was tested for my thyroid. It was normal, but I'm still not feeling great. That is the key that we need to assess further for them. So I'm glad that you brought up the optimal range um, because that is one way to assess their thyroid function a little bit further for their patients if, or for your patients. If they're not within the optimal range, they may be feeling symptoms at this point. And other, another way to look at their thyroid is to do a full comprehensive assessment of the thyroid. And you may be wondering what are the other hormones that we should be testing for in the thyroid lab testing. So as a functional health practitioner, you want to take a look at not only TSH, but we want to take a look at T3, T4 levels, how they are circulating, how T4 might be converting or not converting into T3. We also want to take a look at free T4 and free T3 as well as the antibodies that might be present in these patients. As Dr. Cohen uh, mentioned, there is a disease or an autoimmune condition called Hashimoto's, and this can affect up to 80% of hypothyroid patients, and you might not even be aware of it if you're not testing for it. And anti-TPO is just anti-thyroid peroxidase, which is again, TPO antibodies to the thyroid. And this, these antibodies may be present before a change in TSH levels e uh, might even occur or might even be observed. That's why it's important to also look at these other levels or other markers of thyroid to get a full comprehensive assessment as to what the thyroid is actually doing and how symptoms may be uh, presented in your patients by assessing all of those different markers. Yes, absolutely. The, the inflammatory markers that you mentioned are quite important. Um, there's, there's, uh, there, there's, there's some studies that show that thyroid, thyroid antibodies will actually show up years before the change in the thyroid stimulating hormone is observed. So that's something that is really important to know because with some patients, kind of like stage one of auto, auto, autoimmunity is they have the antibodies show up, right? And that starts to destroy the thyroid. And then stage two is they might start getting symptoms, right? 
that are unexplained. They go to their doctor. Their doctor said, well, I don't know what's wrong with you because your TSA, TSH is normal, right? And then stage three, when their thyroid is being already destroyed, right? Parts of their thyroid is being destroyed. They lose function. They're, now they can actually see it and they go back to their doctor. They can see it in their labs that the TSH is reduced. Uh, the TSH is increased and the thyroid hormones have decreased, right? So that's where it's kind of unfortunate that when patients already being diagnosed with low thyroid, hyper, hypothyroidism, it's, it's typically, if it's, if it's autoimmune, which 80% of it is, it's, it's already been a while, right? It's been, they had this like condition for, for probably a long time. And, and so that's why it's really important to, to get the whole picture, right? Um, what are some of the labs that uh, you like to use, Dr. Chill, or heard of that, that are, could be beneficial? In regards to looking at a comprehensive thyroid yeah. panel? Yeah. Do you have like a favorite, favorite uh, lab facilities? Yeah. Avexia is great. Um, I also use Vibrant Labs. Um, because also with Vibrant Labs, you're able to add on other comprehensive panels to it, and they give you like a package or a bundle uh, for that. So instead of going through multiple different labs, I use Vibrant Labs for multiple <laughs> comprehensive labs that I could put into one package. Yes, absolutely. And those are uh, serum, uh, a blood test, or, uh, or a finger prick? Those are serum for the sure. thyroid panel. Okay. So with those, it's important to note uh, that when you're running a thyroid panel, especially a comprehensive thyroid panel on your patients, you want to set the expectation that they will need to do a serum sample. Um, they'll either have to go into a lab, uh, a, um, a phlebotomist, and they could do the blood draw. And some companies will even send out a phlebotomist for you. Yes, yes. You, you guys can set that up uh, for your patients or just send them to, um, once they get the lab kit, just send them to uh, Quest Diagnostics or uh, one of the local labs to get their blood draw. Um, there is another option that I just remembered that will be beneficial for anybody who's maybe doing a virtual practice and they don't want to deal with uh, blood draw. Um, ZRT. The lab ZRT has a finger prick um, hormone thyroid uh, uh, testing, and it's pr pretty simple to do. So they get the kit, they open it up, they uh, prick their finger, put a few uh, blood spots, close it, and then send it back uh, through, I think it's through FedEx or something like that. Uh, so that's another option. Uh, the lab that lab test specifically does not include reverse T3. Um, I'm not sure if they're not capable of doing it, but they claim that uh, reverse T3 is not essential. Um, and that could be, again, because they can't do it with a dry blood spot. So, but that's just to give you another option if you're looking for it. So, um, so you got Evixia, um, you got, um, you also have the uh, Vibrant America, it's called, right? I think it's called Vibrant America. Vibrant Wellness. Vibrant wellness, yes. So vibrant wellness is another one, um, and then and then you also have uh, ZRT is another option that does a blood spot. So great. So those are really great options for them to uh, recommend. And uh, there's another option that if patients want to order the labs for themselves, so then we don't have to get involved in any of the lab testing. Um, you can send them to Life Extension. Life Extension, the, the supplement company. Um, has uh, uh, multiple labs. They're now introducing more and more functional medicine labs. Uh, it's really good pricing. I think it's like 175 or around around that price, some, somewhere around that price. Patients can pay, can get the lab kit to their home, and then they'll have to get a blood draw, go to one of the blood draw centers, uh, which Life Extension also have like recommendations on their website for where to get that done. So great. I'm glad that we covered that for any practitioner that wants to send their patients to get that tested. And then um, let's talk a little bit about the two major factors that cause uh, that cause the uh, thyroid problems, right? So 
Um, I'll let you start with the first one, Dr. Chill. Yeah, absolutely. So again, we are taking a look at all of the contributing factors that can be impacting thyroid function. One of the main contributing factors or, that we want to assess it, are actually environmental chemicals, and these are called endocrine disruptors. An example of this is chronic lead exposure has been shown to be stimulating or lead to autoimmune conditions such as Hashimoto's, as we discussed. Uh, lead exposure is a primary primary driver of some of those patients. And so we want to take a look at those environmental chemicals such as lead. Another environmental chem chemical to take a look at is perchlorate. And this is a chemical that's found in fireworks, road flares, explosives, and rocket fuel. You might be wondering how this is found in our bodies. Well, it can be naturally found in the environment, but this can also enter the surface through groundwater and it can last a long time in the environment and it's easily absorbed by plants. So it can be found in foods such as collard greens. It can even go into uh, foods uh, that are found also in like foods such as salami. And what uh, perchlorate does is it, it's going to block iodide uptake into the thyroid and it's going to decrease the production of the thyroid hormone. So it's associated with low thyroid function. Another chemical that has been shown to impact thyroid function are PFCs. These are perfluorinated chemicals and these are from flame retardants and they are added to potentially flammable materials. This includes textiles in your homes, plastics. So this could be found in your couch, your bed mattress, your carpets, your clothes, or even electronics. And, and this is all meant to reduce the risk of fires. It can also be found in your cooking tools to keep them from stick sticking. And what these these chemicals from those products can leach into our systems and this can ca cause harmful changes in our liver, thyroid, pancreatic function, and it's even been shown to decrease fertility and interfere with the body's natural sex hormones as well. So environmental chemicals is an important factor to look as a root cause to decrease thyroid function. Mm -hmm. Dr. Cohen, you had another uh, factor to look into yes. for thyroid function? Yes. So we're going to talk about the second one. And I'm so glad that you're bringing up the, the conversation on lead and perchlorate and all of those others because, you know, it's, it's interesting that with most of the medical programs, when you look at the environmental chemicals, it's either they're acute or not at all, mm -hmm. right? It's like either an acute toxicity, like somebody, uh, you know, fell into a, a bucket of like uh, of, of of boiling lead and mercury, right? Or something like that. That's like my, my, my imagination is taking <laughs> me, right? It's like this, somebody fell into this like mixture of cocktail of chemicals yep. and now they, they're in the emergency room. Uh, getting treatment or somebody with, uh, you know, excess alcohol and liver that brought him to liver failure or excess uh, consumption of drugs, right, that got him to the ER. But here we're talking about small amounts of environmental chemicals that make a big impact because lead, for example, like you mentioned, it's found everywhere. It's in old uh, it's in paint of old houses and apartments that were built be be before 1980 it's or 1978. Um, it's found in dust. It's released into the dust in the soil, in the air, right? It's found, it, 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 they found it in children's toys, mm -hmm. right? In furniture, in jewelry, in even cosmetic products that we put on our, on our face or, or skin, right? And, it's found in dishware. Like it's really, those chemicals are really everywhere around us. 
And and so I always remember when we have this this conversation, I always it always reminds me of this this talk. I, I gave a talk once about diabetes. It was for uh, I think it was the nursing association or something like that. And I showed them an interesting graph ab about the amount of chemicals that have been released to the environment, to our, you know, as, as the following the industrial revolution, right? From like 19, the beginning of the 19th century, all the way to today. There's this interesting graph that shows the amount of, chem of chemicals that are released and shows the, and there's another graph that, that shows the prevalence in the U.S. of metabolic conditions and diabetes. And when you look at the graph, it was so interesting to see it. It almost like one-to-one -one correlated. It was crazy to see it, how it kind of increased very, very similarly to the graph of the amount of chemicals we introduced. So um, just remember, it's this is something that unless you use the specialty functional medicine lab testing that we teach in our program, uh, we have a comprehensive comprehensive uh, training on the environmental chemicals and cardiovascular and autoimmune and thyroid and all the other conditions. Uh, unless you're testing specifically for it, you're probably not going to see it, right? And of course, there's symptoms. And once you understand the mechanisms better of, an, of the endocrine disruptor, you start to, it's kind of opening your eyes to see what's up there. But uh, I'm so glad you brought it up because it, it's something that is not talked about at all in primary care offices. So, um, so let's talk about the second factor, which is uh, the sector, second factor that leads to a thyroid condition, and that's gut, gut changes. So when we talk about gut, when we teach in our functional medicine program about gut health, there's, I can simplify it to three types of gut dysfunction. You got changes in the microbiome. We know that the mi gut microbiome, um, if it's balanced and you got the right beneficial healthy bacteria, then they will reduce inflammation, they will secrete some metabolites, they'll help you break down certain carbs, right? So they're really important to keep, keep our metabolism healthy. And it's also really important for preventing inflammatory conditions. So that's one thing. We got to make sure our gut bacteria is, is um, we got a good balance, good diversity. The second thing is we want to make sure that our gut integrity, so that bacteria and their metabolites are not going anywhere. They're staying within our gut, right? And I'm oversimplifying it, but they want to make sure that they're staying within our gut. And then the third thing is you want to make sure that the gut functions properly in terms of producing the right enzymes, the bile, the, the secreting sufficient amount of acid so we can properly break down everything, the foods that we're eating. But just if we just address the gut microbiome, if somebody has a disturbance in their gut microbiome, that could be that they were... Um, they had, they had uh, excess amount of stress, right? That could alter your gut microbiome. They changed their diet. They're missing something in their diet or certain nutrient or fiber or something. That can shift their gut microbiome over time. And this could lead to what we call dysbiosis, which essentially means less of the good bacteria and sometimes more of the harmful or pathogenic or imbalanced bacteria. That by itself can create a pro-inflammatory state that leads to that leads to um, those bacteria and their metabolites to might they might leak into the bloodstream. This is what we call intestinal permeability, and that can trigger a very strong inflammatory uh, uh, response that over time would lead to, would could lead to Hashimoto, could lead to inflammation. So. We always want to look at symptoms of gut dysbiosis. We want to, in some cases, even just test it to see. We send a stool sample to a lab, to a functional medicine uh, uh, analysis, and then we can see. Some, now, obviously, some lab testings are better than others to identify diversity. Some lab testing are better than others to identify inflammatory markers or markers of intestinal permeability. 
But that's really important because if they lose diversity of their gut, then uh, that puts them at predisposition for increased their risk of developing those autoimmune inflammatory conditions. Uh, there's one particular interesting study that showed there that there was an association between abundance of certain bacteria and antibodies against thyroid peroxidase, which is anti-TPO. So patients that have, that means that patients that have an autoimmune uh, Hashimoto thyroid condition, they, it, it's, they're more likely that they have, according to this study, that they have imbalanced gut microbiome, right? That's a, there was a, an association that was found and reported. And then also there's another association between other bacteria such as H. pylori, Helicobacter pylori, and upper GI and thyroid antibodies. So again, we're seeing here if they have over if they have overgrowth of some bacteria, it could lead to or contribute to these development of thyroid antibodies. And then unfortunately, they go to their primary care, and their primary care provider does not look at what's there does not look at antibodies does not look at what's causing the flare-up does not look at their gut does not look at their environmental exposure does not look at their diet does not look at are they missing some essential nutrients like like iodine right um maybe they're consuming enough iodine but like you mentioned dr chill they they have some environmental exposure to perchlorate, or maybe they don't break down, they don't detoxify properly perchlorate or lead or flame retardants. And then, they, so their thyroid is not properly producing those hormones, right? So that's that's another possible cause. Um, any other any other thing that you wanted to mention to this, uh, you wanted to add, Dr. I Schultz? think the biggest takeaway from, from our session today is that Thyroid isn't just TSH, right? As a functional health practitioner, we want to take a comprehensive look at everything that's impacting the thyroid. So not only just the labs itself, where you're looking at a more comprehensive thyroid panel, such as TSH, T3, T4, reverse T3, and then the antibodies that are associated with that. But then we're going to take a look at what are the other impacts that can be the root cause of the thyroid dysfunction, such as environmental chemicals that we uh, that we discuss, along with gut changes. So outside of even the thyroid panel, we want to take a look at other functional labs that can be utilized to give a really good assessment to your patient's health. And I think that's going to be the main takeaway for this. Yes, absolutely. Absolutely. And for any of you who want to dive deeper into the root causes of hypothyroidism, which is unfortunately very, very common. Like I mentioned, it's one out of eight women. Um, we believe that it's probably ha higher than that, that are struggling with thyroid condition. Um, a lot of folks have symptoms, but they're underdiagnosed. Um, and so if you want to learn more about the root cause and the mechanisms and the labs and the treatment protocols, as well as nutrition, like nutritional medicine, not just functional medicine, but nutritional medicine is so critical um, because there's there's specific studies that have shown that, um, uh, for example, there's one particular study that showed that when they added uh, when they added zinc in a certain amount and selenium in a certain amount, they had a significant improvement in levels of T3, right? So learning nutritional medicine is so important because once you dive deeper into nutritional medicine, you also start to understand that many of those nutritional deficiencies, right, put patients in predisposition for getting, you know, getting those conditions, those diseases. So really get a comprehensive um, training to help your patients. And uh, if you're interested in more information, you can head out to our website, uh, the American Academy of Functional Health, and look into our advanced training. So um, this was this was this was a pleasure, and hopefully you found this interesting. Um, you can feel free to subscribe to this if you enjoyed it. Subscribe it and share it with others so we can help our help spread. Uh, you know the the the, uh, the concepts 
of functional health and functional nutrition and wellness to people in other communities. Uh, that's really our number one mission is to really change, transform healthcare. So um, uh, share it, uh, feel free to share it and feel free to um, like, subscribe so we can create more of this good content uh, for you. So I really appreciate it. Thank you, Dr. Chill, uh, for being okay. here and sharing from your knowledge and experience and uh, uh, stay well and best of health to everybody. See everybody later.